Welcome to Chasing Man. I'm your host, Liam McAwee. So what is Chasing Man? Simply, it's just man chats. The whole idea of these man chats is just to hear people's journeys through life, the challenges and the adversity that they've faced along the way. The whole idea is so you can grab some of their tools to throw in your toolbox. So if you ever come to the same situation in your own life, you know how to deal with and get through those situations. All right, team, here we are back for another episode of Chasing Man. I'm your host, Liam McAwee. And today we have Dave Kenny on board. Dave is the co-founder and executive director at Emergo Recovery. Emergo is a private residential recovery and wellness center focused on a brain first approach, specializing in actualized recovery. Dave is a PhD candidate in philosophy and he's focusing on neuroscience and psychology. He holds a master's degree in education and he's also a certified brain health coach with the Amen Clinics. In today's podcast, Dave will dive deep into what it takes to work through this actualized recovery program that he's developed. He's going to talk about, uh, you know, struggles with addiction, anxiety, depression, uh, and other debilitating challenges. He's going to share some of the tactics and strategies that they use at Emergo. And some of those things we talk about is neurobalancing, we talk about nutrition therapy, orthomolecular uh, restoration, uh, positive psychology, smart recovery, uh, CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, is so much in this episode, so much so that we definitely have to have Dave back for a second podcast. And I think we'll just choose one subject and really focus on that next time. So I really hope you enjoy this session. Uh, this is what got me into life coaching, working alongside Dave at Emergo. Uh, and I just think it's an amazing facility. So check it out. Welcome to the show. Lucky enough today to have a, well, I call him a good friend, a mentor, and that is in Dave Kinney. Hey, Dave, how are you? Liam, we are good friends, and it's a pleasure to be here. It's a real honor to be on uh, your show, and I look forward to uh, you and I having one of our deep, fun conversations today. Here we go. So just to give you a, a paint a picture for everybody, Dave is the co-founder and executive director at Emergo Recovery. Uh, Dave has over 30 years of experience in human development and uh, co-created Actualized Recovery, which we're going to talk a little bit about today. Uh, it's an interrogate, interrogate, oh, gosh, I'm going to edit that part out. An integrative brain-first approach to lasting recovery and well-being. Dave is a PhD candidate at Canterbury University studying psychology and neuroscience. And he also has a health and wellness podcast uh, called Emergo Recovery. So, Dave, how is the COVID life treating you? <laughs> uh, well... My wife trimmed up my, gave me a little trim yesterday, so uh, actually two days ago, so I got a little bit of a trim of a haircut. That's a good thing during the COVID times, but other than that, I, I believe this is a tremendous opportunity for everybody, Liam, to to grow and, and move forward in life, and I, I see opportunity at every turn right now. Families connecting more. Uh, there's such great opportunity in this world, cooking at home more. I was at, I was at a... Um, nursery yesterday we bought some flowers for our backyard for the deck there that you know you've been there many times and the nursery said it's the best spring they've ever had and that people are talking about not taking summer vacations but staying home so i i i can see some uh, real greatness out of this and it depends on the mindset but uh you know we all have to deal with this so let's deal with it and i, and I know you've been dealing with it really well yourself yeah, yeah. I mean, it creates opportunities. It makes you get resourceful and 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 pushes you into places where uh, you've probably put things off for a while. So yeah, I'm excited. And and I suppose that's actually a bit of a great segue into the main thing I want to talk to you about today, Dave. Is 
this brain drives behavior idea. I understand brain drives behavior. You're an absolute expert at it, but I don't believe out there in the norm and the society that we live in now, people understand this idea. So can you give us a bit of a, a rundown on what Emergo sort of delivers to uh, the greater masses? There's a lot to unpack there, Liam. I love this. Great question. So first of all, you've got to unpack that a little bit. And what is a behavior? And you can boil it. I like to keep things simple. Um, even though I'm studying neuroscience and psychology, I, I like to put it in a practical or applied terms. So if you talk about uh, what is a behavior, a behavior is a choice or a series of choices. And that then we define that as somebody's behavior, whatever that might be. And the thing that drives choice is your brain, period. Your brain controls what we choose to do. And I, I, I knew we were going to talk about this today. Here's one of my favorite books. If you look at this, it's a massive binder from Dr. Daniel Amen. It's about brain drives behavior. And you have to understand that, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk a lot about that because this isn't, this isn't about – you can't change a, a, a habit or a pattern or a choice or a series of choices if your brain is in an imbalanced dysfunction state. Because sometimes you're doing things, eating sugar, drinking alcohol. Sometimes you're doing things to get neurological relief. So when we don't look at the organ that's making these choices – uh, you've missed something. That's that's like, uh, I use the example all the time. You've heard this from me many times. That's like having a liver that isn't functioning properly and ignoring the physiological liver the, and healing the liver itself. So when, when an organ is not working right, we don't feel good. And the same thing goes with our brain. And so fundamentally, we all got to come from that place is that your the brain is what's driving, if you're in debt, if you have wealth and affluence, uh, the, ch the food choices that you make, your relationships, your certainly your ability to perform at work and sales or at school, at, even at home, and uh, your sleep, all of it and so much more is driven by brain function. And I'm not talking brain chemistry. That's secondary because the engine itself fires. That's the brain function. And that can create then the chemical balance or imbalance in the brain but it starts with brain function or liver function. I'll go, I'll go to liver. If the liver isn't functioning, the chemical balances in our body will be off. Well, you can go ahead and try and balance the chemicals. It doesn't matter. Liver is still not functioning right. So you have to look at brain function, which is how the biocomputer is actually firing and how it works. This is what we do at Emergo, and I absolutely love it, and I fully understand it. So just for the people that maybe don't quite understand that, in layman's terms, basically, Dave, instead of when our brain is not functioning properly, instead of taking a medicine or instead of talking about it, what we're trying to do is balance the brain with the states of parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. Is that correct? That's part of it. So I'll, I'll, as a beginner, you know, kind of one-on-one -on -one thing, I, I grew up in the era where what you had is what you had neurologically, and if you wasted brain cells, you were done, it was gone. It was a static, hard thing, and that's it. That's not true. We now know in neuroscience something called neuroplasticity. A lot of people have heard about it. Uh, neuroplasticity is about the ability for your brain to rewire. It's very important. It was discovered in the 60s. Dr. Di Marion Diamond, a great woman, a great neuroscientist, first discovered this. And here's what it was. And this is important for COVID right now, too, that if you put people in isolation, or in her case, when she tested, you put rats in isolation. She had cages of one or two, even three rats, and nothing else. There was food and water. And they found at the end of their life, because a rat's life is pretty short, their brains shrank in size and in function. They weren't working as well. They weren't as happy. And then they took a group of rats in another, another room, and they had tunnels and toys and sex. There was 18 or 20 rats in it in a very large um, uh, cage. And they had touch from the human handlers and all of this stuff. Their brains grew in size. So just think about that. You're, the only variable is the environment, and their brain shrank or it grew. 
So it's really important, especially through COVID right now, when we are in isolation, that we do things in our environment uh, that, that encourage the brain's plasticity to continue to fire and grow. So what you have today doesn't have to be what you have tomorrow. But that, Liam, goes both ways. I can change my brain good, and then I can do things to hurt my brain and it go back, you know, kind of in a, in a negative way. And, and, and my sleep gets disruptive and, and I have negative thoughts and I have this dark cloud. Um, and, and so the brain has the ability to change. And there's one other part to that puzzle called um, neurogenesis. Neurogenesis, genesis, the ability to grow things, to evolve. Neurogenesis, you can create and grow new brain cells. So if you, if you do certain things, you can grow new brain cells and neuroplasticity, then you can rewire your brain. So if you are struggling, if anybody's struggling, you can change this. You can rewire your brain. It takes some time. It's not, and, and in a society, we want to reach for a pill because we want to feel better tomorrow. Um, and, and you can feel better pretty quickly, but it takes, this is an inside out lasting approach. And even if you get relief from a pill, you have to keep taking the pill because it hasn't fixed anything. That's why the prescriptions go on for a very long time. It's a talk about a bandage solution. I am talking not about a bandage solution. I'm talking about the root of the issue. And when you live in this world of neuroplasticity and neurogenesis and understand, and we'll get into this, there's some practical things we can all do at home, in our office, in our life, and um, that creates um, a, a positive brain function. So it's a, it's a, it's a powerful, we would not, none of us learned this in school. I sure didn't Liam, but it's uh, you can tell I get a little fired up about this because it, it is the way to begin to lay a, uh, a, a, a grand future in your life. You should see the excitement here, team. Uh, I, I, for the listeners, Dave is literally full face to the screen. The man lives this stuff. He is so excited and just throws himself fully into it. And actually, Dave, I think you're a little bit lenient there when saying people want uh, an answer tomorrow. In this day and age we're living in, people wanted the answer yesterday. So the meds seem to be the easiest option for people these days. Or, or right now. And so right now, it's if I want relief now, it's alcohol, weed, it's cigarettes, it's vaping, it's food. So it, it maybe you're right. Maybe a lot of times it's not even waiting for tomorrow. But to but we learn and our brain's real smart, by the way, your brain is will learn quickly how to get relief. And so that's why a punitive approach to drug addiction and alcohol does not work. A punitive approach is to punish the brain doesn't care. The brain wants relief. And so despite um, a, an argument at home, the purse, the brain tomorrow, and you know, no matter how many times I say, I'm never going to drink again. I'm never going to do this again. I'm never going to argue with it. I won't do these things again. And it happens again. That's a sign that your brain is an imbalanced state and it's looking for relief. So Liam, this all started. I, I want to even get bigger than this. My dad was an educator, a passionate guy, and I didn't understand how he influenced my life until, you know, more recently in my life. But it's about people. I don't know of a four-year-old or a six-year-old anywhere in the world who wakes up and says, I can't wait to be a loser. I can't wait to fail. I can't wait to go to school and fail my math. I can't wait to get fired from work. I don't believe in that. I believe in goodness in everybody. I believe that everybody wants, wants success. I'm not talking millions. Success can be family and, and, and um, having serenity and peace and happiness, a body that works and is not in pain. So I believe people want I, greatness and happiness in their life. And the trick or the solution to that is to focus on brain health. Your body will work better. You will feel better. You will sleep better. Your relationships will better. Go down the list when you begin to understand the power of your brain and the ability to change that. Very powerful. And I think it's really important that everybody out there knows, Dave, that years ago, like you said, people were of the understanding that you were either born with this brain 
well, sorry, you were born with that brain. You couldn't get it better. It couldn't get worse. You were just stuck with that. And now we know that to be not true, but we also know that the brain can grow and change for our full life spectrum. So if you're 50, 60, 70 years of age and you're totally given up on that idea, it's totally wrong. The way I like to describe it is the old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks is totally rubbish. You can teach an old dog new tricks. It may take a little longer, but you can teach a dog new tricks. We, we all have neuroplasticity and at any age. And it's, it's similar to if I get a cut on my hand, my hand will feel fat, heal faster if I'm 20 than when I'm 80, but it's going to heal. And so there is, there is hope there. And that's just cells restructuring. It's a, it's a similar concept. Gets a little more in depth when you get into the neuroscience of it, but Liam, this is this is a shame-free understanding about behaviors and patterns, not a shame-based. Why don't you? I know somebody that recently I was working with somebody who said, you know, listen, we we my my wife is in this dark place and dark cloud, and I just told her, and the husband said, I just told her. You've got so much to be happy about. Look at the house. Look at the vacations. Look at all of this stuff. It doesn't matter. This, that's, like, that's like blaming her for having a, a lung or a liver that, or a heart that's not functioning properly. And if her heart wasn't functioning properly, would you have more compassion? He goes, yes. I said, so let's, let's approach this in the same way. And so whether that's drinking, and I'm not a big proponent of AA, if AA helps people overcome uh, addictions and, and things like that, great. And I mean that. I believe that the AA is, is um, behind the times when we look at neuroscience and what's been driving it. It's the brain that's been driving it. And AA has got a real kind of a shame-based approach. You can't use your name. It's anonymous. Well, the first thing I have to say is I'm an alcoholic and I'm powerless over fill in the blank. Well. I don't believe we're powerless. We have choice. So the question is, why do I make negative choices? And when you begin to understand that that's the brain seeking relief from being in a dysfunctioned place, which we can get into a little bit more, then you begin to say, wait a minute, this person's not to be blamed. They have an organ that's not working right. It's ill. And now we have to begin to help that person or I have to help myself. Uh, get relief from that. Yeah. And I've just realized that in the background there, we've actually got actualized recovery up on the wall. So I love it. So let's talk about the, the five main different components to actually having this uh, brain-based behavior. So it, it came out of my uh, thesis or dissertation for my PhD. And actualized recovery comes, the, found, the foundation of the, the name came from Maslow's hierarchy of needs in psychology. And Maslow's hierarchy of needs, big triangle. And you know this, you've studied this, you've taught, I've seen you teach this. And the bottom layer of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, the top is self-actualization, which we all want to achieve and, and we all aspire to. We don't always get there, but that's what we're all after. That's the greatness and happiness. But the bottom part is physiological. So um, what Maslow's saying is self-esteem is about halfway up this, this five-step triangle or pyramid um, and he, what he's saying is you can't work on self-esteem if you don't physiologically have have things have safety have a house uh, have meals uh, have water and air if we don't have these basic principles if our body isn't working right forget about that if I can't sleep there's no way so so self-actualization is is where the play of actualized recovery came from a brain first approach to either recovery, wellness, or well-being, happiness. A lot of our clients over the years, most of the clients have said, it's not the diagnosis, I want to be happy. And so we work in a physiological part. So the first part of that, there's five, you're right, there's five parts to that. If you can imagine a brain in the middle, and then there's five circles around it that all interconnect. And the first one is biology. So how does my body work? Like it's, right. <laughs> it's right. It's right there. It's right there over my shoulder. There we go. 
and and uh, I could bring that. I don't have one closer, but I could bring that closer. But the first the first bubble or first part of that is the biological. So the brain and the body. You know, am I malnourished and you know am I dehydrated? Well, supplements and what kind of food and my brain and how's my brain and other parts of my body working? And then psychologically, and we work in the world of positive psychology. Positive psychology works on um, on my gifts, my traits. VIA Strengths is a great website to go to. Um, and uh, I know you're familiar with all of this too, but positive psychology and life coaching. Coaching is very different than therapy. Therapy works on what happened in the past. What was my trauma in the past? We've all had trauma. By the way, trauma lives in the cells in the nervous system of our brain. But we've all had trauma. And therapy uh, talks about the past trauma. Well, now enter something called the Hebbian Law or Hebb's Rule or Hebb's Law. Hebb's Law in neuroscience says the more you uh, relive or the more you talk about something with emotion, the more you wire it. It's called the more a neuron fires, the, the stronger it wires. So the more I talk about an event, uh, a bullying event, a car accident, an abandonment issue, a, a, a fire, uh, whatever that trauma was, a, a death of a, a loved one, the more I focus on the death of that person or of that trauma, the more actually I am ingraining it in my brain. I don't want to do that. I don't want anybody to do that. So coaching is very different. Co a good coach uh, it talks about what happened, where are you at today, and what do you want tomorrow? What do you want next month? What do you want next year? And a good coach, like a music teacher, will help you figure out how to play the notes and give you suggestions on what to do so you can realize your dreams. So that's part of the psychology. Social, social is so critical. I've already talked about it with Mary Diamond's work and, and how it impacts the brain and the body. We, and, and so there's this old thing about, you wanna know who you are? Look at your five closest friends, not family. We don't get a say in who our family is. Gotta love them. Your, yeah, you gotta love them, but your five closest friends are a mirror. And if you're not happy with things, you may wanna, you're going to probably have to take a look at that. Uh, your spiritual is part of um, actualized recovery. Who you, Liam, are and who I am, our laughter, our smile, uh, you know, that spirit that we have inside. And I'm not talking about a religion. I'm talking about my spirit inside. That's critical. And then lifestyle. And lifestyle is about, uh, you know, my bedtime routine, what time I'm getting up in the morning, what am I eating, what, do I, what am I doing for fun, what's my hobbies, what are my sports, what am I doing with my family. Uh, my work is part of my lifestyle, my career. So there, there's got to be balance between all five of those. And if, you, and if you're not paying attention to one or two of them, it kind of goes off balance a little bit. Very super important, all of these areas. And, and I've loved working on each and every one of them with you at work. The one that really I love and stands out for me is the psychology side of things, this, this positive psychology, because me, I never really understood positive psychology until I started working with Emergo Recovery. Why is it not talked about as much as it should? Like, why, why is there so much basis behind therapy talking about the past and the negative instead of seeing what it is, what you want in life, and moving towards those goals. I think, the, and first of all, positive psychology is relatively new. So that's the first thing. And psychology has been around for, yeah, I would say, 80 to 100 years um, as we know it to be today. So, you know, there's, there's also in psychology some, some different thoughts about that. And, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a vein in psychology where uh, I'm, I, somebody is to be responsible. My parents are to be responsible or, or my boss, or there, there's somebody to blame that brought this on me. And there's other psychology that talks about, um, that I take ownership over everything, that, 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 that I own everything. Positive psychology really focuses on my positive gifts and traits. So my simple example is, can you imagine Mozart? And Mozart, as a child, was off the charts, unbelievable in music. 
and somebody comes along and says, okay, you got that skill mastered, but you're not really good at math, and you need to learn math to keep your book straight and to do well, and so we're going to stop doing music for the next two years and really focus on your deficiency, which I'm hypothesizing might have been math, um, and so we're not going to focus on your gifts. We're going to work on your deficiencies. A lot of therapy works on a deficiency and a shortcoming. Positive psychology says, no, 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 no. Wait a minute. Hang on. You are gifted at something. And maybe it's not music. Maybe it's connecting. Maybe for teachers, connecting with young kids. Uh, maybe it's an engineer whose ability with numbers is off the charts. And positive psychology says, let's create a life around your positive skills and attributes. And you wanna talk about finding purpose in life, which is absolutely critical. You've gotta have purpose. Uh, not just the reason to get out of bed, the reason to go to bed at night. I, I get excited about going to bed at night because I look forward to the next morning. The sooner I go to sleep, the sooner my day starts. Uh, so really purpose comes from this place of understanding what your true gifts are and creating a life around that versus always focusing on one's deficiencies. I'm trying to link everything back to your example of AA as well, because I really enjoyed that example. Would that be an example of not focusing on the positive psychology or the, 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 the right sort of psychology towards actualized recovery, that focusing and reliving of a, a bad experience, a living your life in the past rather than looking at where you're at, moving forward and not totally pushing that away out of your life, but not focusing so much on it. Well, first of all, I want to get into ownership. If somebody has done something, whether they're drinking or not, has done something and wrecked a car, they need to step up and take ownership with that. I'm, I am not at all suggesting people uh, don't take ownership. If you've, if you've said something to a family member and it's hurt them, Ownership is to come back and clean up that mess. So that's really important. So I'm, I'm not at all, I actually believe in, in, in taking full ownership of my choices and my actions. But listen to what I just said, my choices. If I have yelled at somebody, I can say, well, if you hadn't have done this, I wouldn't have yelled. I'm not taking ownership on this. So it is really important to take ownership. Your question about AA and, and their, their methodology and, and where does it sit in psychology, that's a deep question, but I'm going to go back to Hebb's law, that the more I talk about a past negative event, the more I'm going to hardwire that. So if I'm talking about alcohol, if I go to a meeting every day and I'm talking about alcohol, when I'm talking about the last time I was in the ditch and had you know stuff on me and it was a terrible night, uh, the more I'm wiring that into my brain. So I really, but there's a reason why I've made those choices. There's a, there is an online and also there are meetings worldwide called Smart, uh, Smart Recovery. And I think it's smartrecovery.org is the main site of the U.S. And there's online meetings. Smart Recovery approaches this with a cognitive behavioral therapy approach, CBT, which begins to understand and unveil why I've made negative self-choices. It doesn't shame me. It's, it's just saying, okay, you did and you want to make other choices. Well, before you make before we do that, we've got to understand why we made the negative ones so that I can understand how to make good positive choices moving forward. So I have found smart recovery to be more cutting edge and more understanding about the things like cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, uh, brings values into play, and it really focuses more on what I want tomorrow, not what happened last week. And when we, when we begin to focus on what we want, we can attract that. We can create that. The law, the law of attraction begins to come into play. I know with work that if we have the five, five prime areas of actualized recovery fairly balanced, then we move forward to make better decisions. If we are not fun functioning on a, on a proper balanced brain, and we already live in a, in a place with the brain where negative thoughts actually own a majority of our thoughts anyway. Am I under the right understanding that if that brain is not correctly balanced, then those negative thoughts are actually going to be more, more favorable? Sure. And our memory, 
I mean, what I want to I just learn this actually is that our memory is designed to predict the future. I want you to think about that for a minute is that memories that we have are less about, oh, great, isn't that a wonderful thing that happened? Or, my God, isn't it a bad thing? That the, the real reason why, um, uh, talk, think about evolutionary, the reason why we created such a great memory in humans is a survival thing because our my memory helps me predict the future so if i've had negative if i've continued to fail in school i'm probably not going to work on my homework because i'm going to fail tomorrow anyways so my but if i ate a bad berry and i remember i ate a berry and it made me sick or my friend died from it i'm not going to eat that berry so the, the, so memory is a powerful tool in predicting the future and when i believe start to believe that about who I am as a person, it can be a really tough place to be. So we do talk about ants, and Dr. Amen teaches this, and I've learned that from the Amen Clinics, and ants are automatic negative thoughts. So we all have roughly 70 to 80,000 random thoughts a day. Good luck, people who, take, who meditate and say, I can't, I can't stop my brain from thinking, that's like trying to say, you can't stop your heart from beating. You're going to have thoughts, whether you're meditating or not. Your heart is going to continue to beat. It's not, don't judge the thought. And I mean this, an automatic thought is an automatic thought. It doesn't necessarily mean it's true. So what do you do with an ant, an automatic negative thought? First thing you do is you got to question it. And you ask yourself, is that true? I'm a loser. Nobody loves me. I'm never going to have any friends. I'm never going to get, get another date. Is that true? Well, wait a minute. I had some dates before. I've had friends before. I did have this time where I did really well at work. Huh. Okay. So that right now you've just defeated it. It's not a true thought. So now you crush it. You step on this ant. You crush this ant and say, no, that's not true. I'm not a loser. I'm going to, no, I will have some dates. And then immediately, here's the trick, because most people teach this, but they miss this key part. Here's the key part of it. Immediately follow up with gratitude. You have to follow it up with gratitude. So now you are controlling your thought. That's why. So you're, you're versus allowing another automatic negative thought to come back into that, in that void that you've just created. Because your brain's going to think about something. So you have the choice now to let it randomly pick something, or you have the ability to change the functionality of that by using gratitude. And when you get into gratitude, what are you grateful for and why? Why is the anchor? I'm grateful for my dogs. I get the two, the two golden retrievers right here at my feet. I'm grateful for my dogs because they always make me smile. That's rooting the gratitude, and most people don't do that. They just say things that are that you're grateful for, and gratitude is a powerful step in helping your brain leave this this negative valence and create more positivity in your life. So, an ant, crush it, but or sorry, question it, crush it, gratitude, and and anchor the gratitude with why. Four steps, in an, and it's an amazing little trick you can do. And we've also, you know this, we've teach this at night. People having a hard time sleeping, do the gratitude alphabet. Go through the alphabet, A, B, C, D. So uh, you and I will do this right now. Uh, we've done it before. Uh, I'm grateful for apples because they're sweet and delicious. What are you grateful for? I am grateful for boats because they give me the opportunity to sail across the water. Uh, I'm grateful for C. Hang on. I'm grateful for... Charlie, a friend of mine, great friend. So I want you to notice, hang on one second. I want you to notice, I had a hard time. I was processing some things. So as I'm processing, I am still in a state of gratitude. I don't, you don't have to bang these out. So a lot of times people judge, oh, I can't think of anything. I can't do this. No, stay with it. Because as you're staying with it, you are thinking of various things in your life that apply that are you're grateful for. It's a beautiful thing. I might just add in a fourth step to that, Dave, the importance of practicing and practicing and practicing because we've talked about 
the 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 rewiring the neuro pathways once you do it is not enough you've got to continue with constant action constant repetition to grow that grow that pathway grow it stronger that's Hab's law that's that's uh, the more a neuron fires the stronger it wires so whatever that is and, and that includes a.m. routine p.m. routine Liam a lot of people struggle with sleep um, and most people don't understand we need seven or eight hours of sleep your brain needs it we all have heard of the lymph system in our body the, the lymph system cleans everything in our body but one place the brain it does, the lymph system does not clean the brain but it 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 cleanses everything else it's a filter for the body but in our in neuroscience we've discovered about five years ago something called the glymphatic system or the glymph system and the glymph system it works similarly but it's like a power washer and it works at night when we're asleep or or at a stage of rest and the glymph system is like a power washer and it, and it rinses out um, old proteins and and toxins out of our brain and it helps cleanse our brain so and I'll and, and I'll give you a great example if you if you have three or four hours of sleep and you wake up and you're foggy and got brain fog and if you have seven eight hours of sleep and you have a great restful sleep and you're sharp your glyph system has been hard at work and so it's really important that people do create a lifestyle where sleep is absolutely critical to brain health the brain loves oxygen, loves water, it loves proteins and good fats, and it loves sleep. So uh, it, it needs seven or eight hours of sleep. And to be successful with sleep, uh, it's really important to start about two hours before you want to go to bed. So figure out I, if you want to get up at six in the morning, you want eight hours of sleep, well, that's 10 o'clock, but you don't want to go to bed at 10, you want to be asleep. So by eight o'clock, you want to start shutting things down. What are you eating all day? What are you drinking in the afternoon? Coffees, Red Bulls are terrible. You know, all that stuff. So, so be mindful of what you're eating. Are you having something sugary right before bed, 7, 8 o'clock? Well, good luck sleeping at 10 o'clock because you've just activated everything in your body. So, it's, so good sleep starts also with preparation. Turn computers and TVs off or... I have my blue light glasses are upstairs or wear great blue light glasses if you have to be on a device, but shut them down an hour before, turn your devices off and connect with your family. Read a book, not a tablet, read a book and begin to help yourself. And again, this goes back to your thing. Do this in repetition. You've got to create a routine. Your brain will love it. And eventually you won't even have to think about these things. It will become just part of your routine. But that's the key to, to creating good sleep is how you prepare in the afternoon. Uh, have you moved your body? What are you drinking? What are you eating? What are you doing two hours before? Shut your technology down an hour before at least. Uh, blue light from technology actually stimulates the brain. It tricks the brain. And the brain thinks it's sunrise, so it doesn't create any melatonin. Well, that's what we need to help us sleep. So you can use melatonin for a short period of time when you're traveling three days, five days, but don't use melatonin long term because then the brain doesn't create its own melatonin. But if you shut technology off, uh, the brain will begin to, in darkness, begin its natural rhythms called a circadian rhythm. I just want to jump back a bit there because uh, I'm a big gratitude man and I loved how when we squish that ant, you want us to really work on the gratitude side of things. Can you just explain to everybody a little bit more of why that gratitude is so important? Gratitude is, is massively important in helping your brain with those automatic negative thoughts. And when I live in a state of gratitude, I'm, I guess I'm in a state of positivity. And when I'm not, I'm in a state of blame. I'm a victim. And, I, and you know, we can get in, which we've done before, get in this whole triangle of the victim triangle of a victim, a persecutor, a bad thing, a bad event. And then there's always a rescuer. Sometimes the rescuer is online gaming or online sex or uh, it can be a family member rescuing me, a, a spouse or a parent. Uh, and, and when I step into gratitude, I step into being a creator in my life. And that's a real powerful place to be. 
to be in a state of, uh, of, of to be a creator. So, you know, recently we had a fire here, a terrible fire, and we've lost a lot of things. And it was that night when we looked at each other and actually said, I don't know why, but there's greatness here. And, we're gonna, and I look forward to seeing why this happened. There's opportunity here. It was a terrible event. We lost, and I was sad for a while. It, it was a stressful, very stressful period for a couple of days. Or, and but but changing my mindset and stepping into what am I grateful for? All of us are safe. The dogs are with us. All of the things that were important were, are with us. Uh, everything else will take care of itself. And when you step into that state of gratitude, even a traumatic event becomes a different event. So we get to choose how we respond to the world. Shit is going to happen. It is. It is. Sometimes life is tough. So it's not that, it's not, you know, this head in the clouds and fairy tale thing that everything is going to be roses. No. But I get to choose how I respond to an event. Uh, and, and I choose to stay in this place of gratitude and thanks um, and I look for that even in times when times are tough. There's a reason why things are happening. Every time in my life, every time in my life, I look back, I can see greatness out of the traumas that I have had to go through. So it's not that we're not going to struggle. What do you do with that and how do you manage that? And gratitude is one of the greatest tools to help you have a great. So here's a great, we've just started this new thing. Wake up in the morning. First thing out of first thing in my head, first thing, and I say it out loud, usually before my feet hit the ground. Today is a great day. And I it makes me smile. Today is not today's going to be, not maybe. It is a great day. So it's a statement of positivity, a statement of gratitude. Um, and it begins before I've moved. It changes my entire rhythms and my uh, my biochemistry in my body with a statement like that. What a way to wake up, right? Instead of like the norm, like society does, and they pick up their phone and automatically fall into that reactive state, you have decided just to wake up and start the day on your terms because you choose it. I love that idea. Love it. Well, the day's going to happen, my friend. The day the day is going to happen, and good. Good, bad, indifferent, ups, downs are going to happen. Well, but I get to choose how I react to that. So do you. And I know that you're a guy of positivity and gratitude. You, It, it oozes out of you. That's why I love hanging out with you. Thank and, you. And, and, but, it, but it's also something that you have, you have created, you have developed over time. It's, it's, not, it's not something that we just wake up with as babies. It is, it is a, there is an effort behind it, and then the more you do it, it becomes part of our behavior again, part of our who we are, and and I know that that's just that is part of you, and it's what attracts everybody to Liam. Because uh, when I say Liam's an awesome guy, it's all about positivity and gratitude, and that's that is one of the core tenets I believe that make you up. Well, and the thing that I love about it, which uh, I learned really well at Emergo, is if you are living from that place of gratitude, you cannot have the other emotion working at exactly the same time. The brain does not work in those ways. Do you want to explain that a little more? Oh, I love this stuff. You kidding me? So you're talking about the nervous system and the brain again. You are because the brain, the brain and the nervous system is a, is a, can only handle one thing at a time. And here's my example. Uh, think of a time, any, anybody listen to this, think of a time that you were enraged, just furious. Is it possible to see, feel rage and being furious and happy at the same time. No. Is it possible to feel joy and happiness and also feel joy and happiness and be sad and depressed? No, it is not. The nervous system can handle one thing at a time. And so you get to choose. If, if you are in a, a depressed state, a sad state, uh, I, would, I would ask you to take out a piece of paper and a pen and write down five things you're grateful for and why. And some people go, no, I don't want to. Well, when you hear that, you go, okay, wow, you still want to stay in that place. And you can explore that and unpack that a little bit as to why. But the people who do their best to step into gratitude of five things that they're grateful for, and before they're done the fifth one, they've already changed how they feel. 
They've already begun to change that. So it's a really powerful thing. You cannot be in a state of gratitude and a state of depressed depression. You can't be in a state of gratitude and anxious and anxiety. You can't be in a state of gratitude and angry or furious at the same time. It's impossible. So now you get a choice. When you, when, you, when you find that you've gone there, which we all do, I'm not saying you can't go there, but if you want something different and you find you're anxious or you find you're ticked off, use your gratitude to come out of it and try, try writing down five things. Because when you write it down, it actually ingrains in the brain deeper than just uh, thinking it or saying it. I think what I'm going to have to do at the beginning of this uh, podcast, in the introduction, I'm going to tell people to get pens and papers ready because there's a lot of knowledge bombs being dropped here, Dave. It's absolutely fantastic. We started actually not planning on it, but we started from a place of gratitude. We've gone through, we've talked about gratitude. We've finished on gratitude. I was going to ask you to, to close it up with five main things, especially I think at this time with, uh, I like the idea that you talked about that deprived environment, the isolation environment that we're living at the moment. If you could give everybody five tips that are going to help with their, their balanced brain in, an, in a COVID world right now, five things that can help us to to keep our shit together, Dave. How do we keep our shit together? <laughs> All right, five, five take-home things. I got my water bottle here. I've seen you've been drinking out of your water bottle. The brain loves water. Please get it. The brain is actually a very malleable mass. It's not hard. It's like it is the, the consistency of tofu, and the brain and the body needs water. So please drink lots of water throughout the course of the day. I, I aim for three of these. I got 24 ounces here, which at 700 mils. It looks like you do too. I aim for three of these a day. Trained by the so, beast. Um, for the, list, uh, the listeners, I'm holding up my water bottle. Got it. Number two. Right. So number two. Number, number two is your sleep. You've got to have great sleep. So think back earlier in this podcast about how you're preparing for sleep and what you're doing with that. And, you're, and think about resetting your circadian rhythm, which, which you can do over time. Uh, number three, the brain loves oxygen, and so movement. We haven't even had a time to get into movement and exercise, but exercise and movement is really, really important. Uh, and, and even if – depends on your, your ability. So even if walking around the, the, the block is where you're at uh, and you want to take a pet with you or family member or by yourself, do that. The movement and breathing and oxygen and breath work are amazing for the brain and the brain loves that and and i would say it's actually better to do it multiple times in the course of a day uh when i'm when i'm coaching uh executives and, and entrepreneurs and business people i talk about uh you know using meetings while you're walking and, and get people moving if you're in an office tower in canada in winter use the stairs a couple times throughout the day don't go for coffee instead of the coffee pot go for an oxygen break and move your body, and that will wake you up. You'll be more alert. You'll be more sharp. You'll be able to function better. Uh, and even if the even if the family's driving you bonkers in COVID, uh, movement for the kids, not a timeout. Don't give them a timeout. Have them go outside and move their bodies, and you'll you'll find that you have a different kid on your hands. Uh, and for your own sanity, please get out and walk and move your body. Uh, food, we have not talked a lot about nothing about food, Liam, but food is, it's not just what I put in my body, it's what I do not put in my body. Cigarettes, ab, you know, and vaping, ab, and, and all tobacco products, absolutely god-awful, terrible poison for a brain. Alcohol, that we've heard one glass of red wine for your heart. No, alcohol is not a brain-healthy food. Alcohol hurts brain function. So no alcohol is better than some, but a little bit is better than a lot. So depending on where you're at with that, uh, again, if you, if, you're, if you find that you really want to curb that, look at smartrecovery.org, uh, great, great organization. But alcohol is not a brain food. So uh, the other thing is and marijuana is absolutely terrible long-term for a brain. I get marijuana may give you relief to help you sleep in the short term. Uh, may help with anxiety in the short term. I understand that. 
and it's designed to calm a brain. The THC slows brain function down, but you actually are doing damage to the brain itself long term. And uh, you know, if you want to go to the Amen Clinics, A M E N Clinics.com, you can look at some images of brains on any of these things, and and when you see it, you go, "Wow, wait a minute, that's terrible." So it's not that. It's not that weed is, or marijuana or cannabis, whatever word you want to use, is better than alcohol, better than tobacco. They're all, all three of those are not good for the brain and do impair uh, brain function, thus changes our behavior, who I am as a person. Uh, so food, food loves clean protein, uh, lots of veg, uh, we're more, you know, and, and, uh, and fruits, no refined sugars, no glutens. No legumes, very limited, if any, dairies. So it's a paleo, a paleo lifestyle. It really fits well for a really healthy brain lifestyle. So you know, if you want to go into the keto world and all and all of that stuff, but I, uh, the brain does like the 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 combination of the veg and the protein and good fats and good water. Uh, it functions optimally when we eat that way. And I think that's I think that's four. You got me all excited. I've, I've lost count. Uh, it is and, and all, fifth, but I think there's about twenty in there. <laughs> well, no, hang on, because I'm I'm going. I want water. What do we say? We said water. We said uh, sleep. We got food, exercise, and movement. So those are the four big ones right there. And then the last one would be socially. Who are you connecting with? And and, and that's really important. We've got to have a social connection. Isolation is not good. Uh, thank goodness for Zoom and the world, and I, and I mean that. It's helped us stay more connected. Uh, it doesn't take the place of things, but put your phones down. Put your games down. Uh, stop gaming and phone and, and social media and connect with people and, and, and find like-minded people. If you're into CrossFit, CrossFit. If you're into music, go to a music place. Uh, if you're into dance, go to a dance place. Uh, so find, if you're into knitting, find a place where there's knitting and, and book clubs, connect with people, uh, with a, with a like mind. And that's really important to our health, our wellness and our happiness. Super podcast. Um, you, I'm, I'm, I share the same passion as you when it comes to this subject and I'm already thinking, oh my gosh, we're going to have to do this again really, really, really quickly to keep this momentum up. One half hour session is definitely not enough to talk about a, a 30 years of experience. So, Dave, I really appreciate uh, all your time today. Uh, if people want to reach out to you, where's the best places to reach out? Um, you, you know, I guess you can look at our website, emergorecovery.com. You can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, Emergo, by the way, is E M E R G O. It's a Latin word, it means to rise up or rise above. You can find me on LinkedIn, it's real easy, just Dave Kenny, K-E-N-N-E-Y, put in a Mergo, there I am, boom, that's pretty easy too. Uh, my email is dave at emergorecovery.com. And the podcast? Well, it's Emergo Radio, I forgot about that. We do, we've do. we got a podcast called Emergo Radio, it's on all the, it's on Stitcher, it's on uh, Apple. Unfortunately, Stitcher and those guys haven't offered me $100 million like Joe Rogan, but uh, maybe one day you and me, Liam, will be up there with that, okay? We'll get there, mate. We'll do it together. Hey, That'd be thanks, awesome. I, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day, and I can't wait for episode two with you, mate. I'm in, Liam. I love, I love chatting with you, connecting with you, and what you bring to this world is an absolute gift, and I just I want to put wind in your sails. Keep going, baby. Keep thanks, going. Thanks, dude. There's not a problem. No one's going to stop me. <laughs>